Kisov shoots it to flick it right in. Peter Angelo save rebound. Stastny stopped by Peter Angelo. I don't believe that save. Even if Peter Stastny. He can't believe the save that Peter Angelo just made on him. As Frankie Sparkling on that maneuver there to stop and rob Peter Stastny. He should get 5 to 10 for that. Oh. Hello and welcome to episode 67 of Tendy Talk. Presented by the Hockey Podcast Network and the BLPA Podcast Network. I am your host, Joe, better known as Wash Up Goalie on social media. This week, I chat with Pete Fry, the Goalie Mindset Guy, who you've heard on other podcasts like the In Goal Podcast and the Goalie Hacks Podcast. In this episode, we talk about how Pete got into hockey, what he learned from skating with former guest Ed Belfour, and what we goalies can do to help the mental side of our game. So, without further ado, let's get to the conversation with Pete. Pete, thanks for joining me on the podcast, and thanks for being flexible. Uh, I got a little little sick uh, late last week that uh, oh, caused us to reschedule. Hey, mm-hmm. it, it is what it is. I'm feeling better now, and uh, so oh, thank great. you for being flexible. Yeah, uh, great to be here. Where 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 are you, Joe? Where are you located? I am in the uh, Twin Cities, up in Minnesota. Oh, I love it. Yes, yes, oh, nice and cold here. It's like thirty below zero today. Yeah, we're, 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 yeah. Are you like right in the Twin Cities? I am in the Northeast Metro uh, in the White Bear Lake area. Uh, okay, go Bears. I, <laughs> I have an old, I had an old business that had a training center in, in uh, White Bear Lake. Oh, very cool. Yeah. I spent a lot of time there. I loved it. Yeah, we're, I'm technically, technically in Hugo and I joke that Maddie Rooney is my neighbor because she just moved into Hugo, but uh, not, not quite my neighbor. <laughs> a development. That's awesome. Over. Yeah. Yeah. Um, one of my, uh, one of my clients, he just signed with Minnesota wild about three weeks ago and he's up with the taxi squad. Now I believe Zane McIntyre. Oh yeah. I've, uh, I've followed Zane a little bit over the years. Yeah. He's a Minnesota boy. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, what a great last name for, uh, Minnesota, you know, home of the honey crisp apple. You got the Mac and, you know, yeah. Uh, <laughs> totally. But, yeah. Um, so I, I don't know if you've had a chance to listen to any of the, the other podcasts I've done, uh, but it, it's really a chance for me to talk to other goalies and folks, uh, associated with goaltenders to, you yep. know, just talk to position, uh, really, and, and talk about, uh, interests outside of the game. But I, I always like to start, uh, you know, very much like our friends over at in goal. How did you get started in the great game of hockey? Okay, so we're, we're starting right now. I just want to make sure. Okay, so we're starting. This is the official start of the podcast. Okay, for sure. <laughs> um, making you, so were, were you a goalie? Like, so did you, you grew up playing goal in Minnesota? Uh, so I, I actually grew up in Chicago uh, and I started playing uh, as a squirt and I, I was okay. goalie, played through high school and then uh, played JV Division three college hockey here up in Minnesota and as they say, the old it. story, I met my wife in college. She was from up here. So now we live up Aww. here. <laughs> you gotta love that. Yeah. That's fantastic. That's so are you a Blackhawks fan? Yes, very much so. You know, Eddie Belfour is one of the reasons I fell in love with the game and the position. So Ed Belfour. Well, I remember I got brought up with the Olympic team and he was the other goalie there before he played in Chicago. Oh, really? I, I had him on uh him and his son on the podcast uh about a year ago. And they were really? talking, yeah, they were talking about their whiskey, which if you like whiskey, give it a try. I'm not a whiskey drinker, but even I like this stuff. Um, yeah. But Dane and I played for the uh, same youth organization. So we had a lot of fun okay. talking. It was kind of funny because I've listened to some of uh, Ed's other podcasts and he's a little reserved. You know, he, he's he's a guy that keeps to himself, but he, he knows he's got to put himself out there because of the whiskey brand. But yeah, uh, he's got to be prom- promoting now. Yeah, but Dane and I, we were on the, the Zoom call before Ed got on, and we're just talking, yeah. going back and forth, and just totally ignored the fact that he joined the call. And, you know, I, I think that kind of um, caught him by surprise, but also relaxed him. So uh, I, I've had a few buddies, and they're, they're like, you know, he, he seemed a little looser with you guys than you than uh, other ones. And I said, well, I think it's because we completely ignored him when he came in. <laughs> That 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 could be the case. Yeah, that could be the case. I'm trying to get my lighting right. Yeah, and, so and Dane is uh, a you know goofy, you know outgoing fellow in his own right. So that that helped. So is Dane your partner in this? 
<laughs> no, the, the, Dane, Dane is uh, Eddie Belfour's son. So, but, oh, got it. Okay. Yeah. So I, I had those two on together because Dane was also wow. a goalie. And, uh, okay. but we, we played for the same youth association. So we're sitting there talking about the old rink and the pro shop across the street and all this stuff. And Ed's like, Hey guys, <laughs> that's awesome. Yeah. No, th- love it. Th- this, this is a solo gig. Uh, as I've told the story, uh, I had the idea of Tendy talk for a while, but never really did anything with it. And it was about two years ago for Father's Day. My wife and kids got me a microphone and a book on podcasting and said, do it. Uh, so, oh, yeah. I love it. Yeah. So it's uh, been a nice little labor of love. Yeah. Yeah. That's fantastic. Here. Sorry. I'm just, I'm almost there. No, I usually don't have any lighting trouble, but uh, <laughs> just trying something new. How's yeah. that? Is that clear? Can you see yeah, that all right? Yeah. You look great. Okay. <laughs> okay. Okay. So how Let's did rock. how did you get started in this great game of hockey? How did I become a goalie? No, just even before you get there, how, how did you get started in the game? It, it was a goalie right from the start when I played. Yeah. Same here. My my yeah, my, my family's from Toronto. We're from a little place called Kleinberg, is where I grew up. Okay. And just outside of Toronto and there was a, a hockey association not too far from there called Rexdale and so they signed me up when I was I was six or seven I believe and uh yeah and I just loved it right from the start I was a big Ken Dryden fan but you know I would my dad took me to some Toronto Maple Leafs games and my parents were, were my parents came over here from England oh okay so, what, what part of England uh, from Gravesend, which is doesn't sound like that appealing. From Gravesend in Kent. <laughs> okay, my grandmother was a war bride from Kings Lynn. Oh, really? Wow. Yeah. yeah. Okay, so so you you are British. You 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 have some British in you. Yeah, I, my dad tells the joke. My grandmother married a Irishman, and uh, so he says he doesn't know which half of himself to hate more. <laughs> yeah, yes, yeah, I know my my wife's Irish. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I have good battles with the in-laws. Yeah. Yeah. So they, they came here. Uh, well, not here, but they, they came to Canada, you know, searching more opportunity, I'm assuming. Yeah. 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 For sure. For sure. Yeah. So the family came over in the fifties. I had two, uh, two older sisters that were actually born in England and came over here and I got three older sisters in, in total. Um, yeah. They came over here searching opportunity and uh yeah, they, they were fantastic hockey parents, great hockey parents, right? They got me into it, but they didn't know a lot about the sport, which maybe that was a good thing. Yeah. So they just let me play if I wanted to play. And I really developed a, a love for the game right from a right from a young age. I remember my first year in hockey. And let's see, I don't remember if my first year I was six or seven. I just forget. But I remember winning like the top goalie trophy. And my, my goals against average was 0. 0.8. Eight one. It was wow. actually under one. Zero point eight one. It, it's never been the same after that. It was just that one year when you could lie down and no one yeah. could shoot the puck over you. It's funny you say that. My first year skating as a squirt, and my coach, I remember him telling me, you know, just just go down. They, they can't lift the puck anyway. And I swear that hamstrung me for the next few years because I just got in that habit of going down even when I shouldn't have. Um, you know, and, and now. You know, I mean, when we learned to play, it was a much different position and still playing beer league. And, you know, some of these younger guys, it's like, oh, why, why, why are you going down all the time? You need to stand up a little bit. Uh, yeah. Some guys are just trained on their knees right from the start. Yeah. So different game. You said you were a goalie from from the get go. You know, you were a fan of Ken Dryden. But what was it that drew you to the position? I, I probably wasn't, it wasn't that good a skater. Uh, that was probably one of them, right? Back then they would put the guy who couldn't skate in goal. Yeah. So that was, that was, that was probably a big thing there. And uh, they, they, they needed a goalie. They needed a goalie. It's different. Like nowadays, a lot of times when so, you're, you're playing all different positions, when you start, no one's allowed to be a full-time goalie mm-hmm. a lot of times until you're 10 or 11 or 12, but it was just, it was just different then. And so it just, uh, just kind of, kind of, kind of grew on me. 
you know, and I, I think that's kind of what it was for me too. It was they, they needed goalies and my hand went up and I was like, yeah, I, I want to try that out. But I was also a catcher in baseball. So there's probably something with the equipment where it's like, yeah, I, I like things being hurled at me. I don't know. Uh, yeah, there, there you go. Who, who's another, who's another, Stan, who's a Stanley Cup winning goalie that was also a catcher in baseball? Not in pro, but he was really good. Oh, God. I think he won a few Stanley Cups. Little trivia. I was going to say, did, did Grant Fuhr play catcher? Bingo. Uh, I was going to say, yeah, I, I thought I saw something about him playing baseball in the offseason. Yeah. yeah. Yep. That's him. He was the guy. Yeah, he he's a fun, fun one to listen, talk to. I, I watched his uh, Coco documentary. God, was that so good. Oh, that was great, wasn't it? Yeah. I, I kind of felt bad for him, like the way that they kind of made him the scapegoat or the, the guy there and stuff. Yeah, 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 that was that was that was fantastic i i actually uh you know after like i was born in toronto but when i was eight years old my family moved out to victoria the victoria cougars that's where mm -hmm. I, I saw him play junior there oh very he cool great goalie and junior he was a great goal so you get playing in the game of hockey you know your parents are immigrants so that you know as you said they, they were great hockey parents probably because they were just letting you play a sport they were still learning so they didn't know you know, like some of the parents today of where to try and push you and everything else and just let you develop. Um, you know, how, what was your progression in the game? How far did you go? You know, I, I asked because I'm sure I know some of uh, my younger listeners probably don't know. <laughs> yeah, well, my first year, I, I don't know if there was rep there, there might have been, but I just played like house hockey my first year. And my second year, so I think I was seven and then eight or eight, nine, uh, no, seven and then eight years old. Yeah, I was uh, played house hockey. And then we moved to Victoria. Then we moved to Victoria. And I think when we moved to Victoria, that would have been for my, my third year mm -hmm. of hockey. And I remember going to school in Victoria and just being very disappointed because in Toronto, it was like hockey was everything. Everyone I knew, everyone I mm -hmm. talked to played hockey. That's probably why I played. But in Victoria, there was a lot smaller percentage of people that, that, that played hockey. There was, they, would, they would do, you know, they would ski, they would play rugby, they were playing a whole bunch of different sports there. And I remember just feeling, I remember this is how much I loved to play is I felt sorry for the kids in the class that didn't play <laughs> hockey. It's like, like, and that was genuine. That was not a criticism of them I just felt sorry for them because they didn't get to experience what what I felt was like just a fantastic experience and so so when when we moved to Victoria that's probably when I started to develop more um I I I, I played well we I guess we we had tryouts for what was I nine then I think I was nine so it was uh Adam I guess it would have been Adam uh, at the time and uh, I think that's the equivalent to squirt mm -hmm. maybe in the U.S. And, and I made like this this all-star team and then I played on the house team and the all-star team and then the next year as a 10-year-old uh, I went and we went to like our trials for Adam and they actually brought me up to peewee and I made the peewee rep team as a as a 10-year-old so it was the, the other goalie who was 12 and myself who was 10 on the, on the Pee Wee rep team. So I was with players that were, you know, quite a lot older than me that year. And uh, I think it probably helped me develop. Uh, it was a, a little bit of pressure uh, to, to, to play there at that, at that, that point. And I can still remember the other goalie on my team back then, he had one of those flat masks Okay. Like I, I never had one of those, but he still, had, I remember it was like the coolest paint job on it. And that was just when things were changing for masks. Yeah. Going to cages. And I had like a helmet in a cage. I never had a flat mask. Maybe it's a good thing. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I, I had one of those old Mylek plastic ones for street hockey and, you know, yeah, you, you get hit in the face, you felt it. It, it was like 
What, why, yeah. why do I have it on? <laughs> exactly. Exactly. I can remember playing street hockey back then too. Like I just loved it. It was, yeah. it was different than today, right? There was no video games really. It was just like, it was such a cool thing to do. Yeah. So you, you wind up uh, play, playing above, above your age group and, uh, but you know, you didn't just end at rec sports, you know, you played pretty competitively for a while. Um, you know, as, as you mentioned, you know, playing on the national team with Eddie Belfour. Um, at what point did you say, you know, I, I've gone as far as I can go. I need to transition into life after competitive hockey. Well, well, basically after like, so I played minor hockey and then at 15, I first got brought up to the Western Hockey League and then played in the Western Hockey League. Had a great year as a 16 year old, was ranked in some of the top goaltenders could get drafted the next year. I had a terrible year as a 17 year old, didn't get drafted, didn't have the right mindset. That's why I do right now, the goalie <laughs> mindset guy. And as a 19 year old, I got drafted by New Jersey. Remember my first thoughts being, I don't have a chance. Like I just want to get in the whole confidence and mindset thing. Uh, and then, so I went to university and, and that's when, I, when I was at university of Calgary, that the Canadian national team brought me up to practice. Right. So I went up to practice with them. I never actually played any games with the, the national team. And Ed Belfort was the other goalie when I went up there to, uh, to, to practice with them. And, and I remember something really neat that, that I did learn, uh, from that, uh, Dave King was the coach of the team, right? Dave later coached the Columbus blue jackets and the mm -hmm. Calgary flames, the national great guy. Uh, and, and uh, he was really good at the end of practice. He brought Ed and I down to one end and we did this drill where you got a uh, player, you got a player and a puck on one dot and on the other face off dot, you got a player, a simple pass across and a shot, a lateral movement drill for goalie. And so I go in there and I kind of want to impress these guys. So I'm like, ready, I'm ready. I'm really tight in there, like probably too tight pass goes across, I explode across, I make the save. As soon as I make the save, I just go right back to the start, right? And boom, the pass goes across, I explode across, make the save, go right back to the start. Boom, 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 boom. After nine or 10, I got, I was exhausted. <laughs> and then, then Ed Belfour went in and it was totally different than, than, than what I did when he went there. Was, like I stopped the first six or seven and I don't think I stopped the last three or four. Mm -hmm. I was lost my focus. I was a little tired. So when he goes in there, he's got his really low stance and he's, his hair kind of coming down and, and the pass goes across, he explodes across, makes the save, jumps on the puck, and then gets up and takes his time. Takes his time, maybe 10, 15 seconds later, he's back uh, at the start of the drill again. And he's like, okay, I'm ready. Boom, next one. Pass goes across, he explodes across, makes the save, rebound goes to the corner, falls it all the way, takes his time, gets up. And so after every one, he played it right to the end, but then he took like an extra amount of time in between before he got his next shot. And so I asked him after, I'm like, Ed, what, what, what's up with that? What, all that taking your time and stuff like that. And, and he's like, hey, he goes, it's simple. He goes, it's really simple. You got to practice just like a game or it's not going to help you at all. So I thought that was interesting because my, my thought towards that drill was just get in there, make the save, go right back to the start. So I was doing my drills to do the drills mm -hmm. for the coaches or whatever, whereas he was doing the drills to get better for a game. Makes sense. And, and, and you think about it, there are no accidents out there, right? He became one of the, best goalies of all time yep absolutely you know and it, it, it's interesting you mentioned that because when I played in, in practice I would focus on the puck coming down at me and my teammates were always mad because you know if they were close together it's like that second group isn't getting my focus I'm watching that shot I'm watching that rebound you know I'm, I'm still gonna try and get over there as quick as I can but I need to follow this one right here for that old adage practice like you play and yeah. in games I didn't give up on shots so why why would I do that in a practice you know yeah yep there you go yeah there you go so yeah so that, that was a great lesson great lesson from uh 
from Ed Belfour there, right? And and I learned a lot of a lot of lessons along the ways with players that I played with that you know maybe moved on and you know had some great success and and stuff like that, right? When I, like I say, when I was fifteen, uh, I'm in grade ten. I'm in science class, and I get a call to the principal's office. I'm like, oh no, not again. I'm going to the principal's office. <laughs> so I get there. This is before cell phones, right? Because this would have been the eighties. Yep. This is before cell phones. So I get the principal office. They're like, hey, it's your dad on the phone. I'm like, whoa, did someone die or what happened here? Why is, why is he calling me? So I, I get, I get the phone. He's like, hey, uh, the Portland Winterhawks called. They're going to bring you up for the three game road trips. They just listed me like a few back there. There was, there was no Western hockey draft. They would put you on player lists. Mm-hmm. Right. So, so when I, when I turned 15, I had the option to pick Portland, Victoria, Seattle, or Kamloops. I think those are the four options. And I don't know, Portland showed the most interest. So I went with them. So they're like, I'm like, wow, okay. Cause I was just playing first year midget as, as a goaltender. And uh, so I meet the team on the road trip and they pick me up. Uh, uh, they, they, we bust to, to, we're in Calgary. We bust to medicine hat for the first game. I remember on the bus, like looking around like the player, Cam Neely was one of the, one of the players on the team oh, there. Cool. Uh, I don't know if you remember John Cordick. Remember John Cordick? Mm-hmm. The name's Tough familiar. Guy? Yeah. Yeah, yeah, he was on that team. Uh, uh, Elfie Turcott, Richard Crom. I think he played for the uh, Blackhawks for a while. I think so. Yeah, yeah, he he was one of the players on the team. Playfair, Jim Playfair. Um, they had a lot of great players, like a lot of really, really good players. I think that year when they, when they went to the Memorial Cup, they actually Mike Vernon. They picked up Mike Vernon to be their their tender for the Memorial <laughs> Cup there. But so 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 we go. We're playing in Medicine Hat. And remember, this is this is why I do what I do now with the mindset because I think I was just a mess back then as far as like the whole mental game goes. Mm-hmm. And so it's the first game that's you know, don't worry, you're not gonna play. You're not gonna play. You're just gonna sit on the bench. And Bruno Campessi was he was the, the other goalie for Portland. He's now a scout for Vegas for the Golden Knights there. And uh, so Bruno's starting. He's in goal. I'm on the bench, like I'm looking around. First time I've really been in front of a lot of fans, like there's 3,000, 3,500 medicine hat. And they're kind of yelling sieve to me or whatever. They could tell I was out of, out of, you know, kind of out of my element there sitting there. And I swear less than one minute goes in the game and a player on medicine hat, you know, shoots on Bruno. He makes a save and the player runs through the crease and knocks him down. So Bruno's lying on the ground there, like, like not moving. Yeah. And I'm like, I'm starting to panic <laughs> on the bench. And and the coach, Ken Hodge, he had these big like Coke bottle glasses. Ken was, he was very intimidating. Uh, Ken Hodge was the type of coach that wouldn't say hi to you if he saw you on the street. Like that's, you know, very intimidating. He looks over and he's like, Peter, get ready. You're going to go in. <laughs> and if someone says, when was the time in your life when you were the most scared? It would have been then. Like I, I was like freaked out. I was imagining everything that could go wrong as a goalie, like everything. I, like, that's that, Those are the only images in my head. The red light, the pucks going past me, everything negative. Uh, I was so scared. I wanted to grab the mic from the PA guy and just say, if anyone in this building has goaltending experience, come on down the ice level. You can, you can have my gear. That's how scared I was. Anyways, I'm hot, starting to hop over the boards and Bruno Bruno gets up and, he, and he's okay. Um but, but if I look back at that moment, that's a little bit of a defining moment because really when he got hurt, I should have been excited to go in. Mm-hmm. You know, if I had the right mental state, the right images, the pregame visualization, all that key stuff, the movement for confidence, then I'm going in, I'm kicking him out of the net saying, Bruno, you're still hurt. I think get out of there. So I'll, I'll take over. I got it. Yeah. Which you think of it in all those those defining moments, they, they can make a difference for a goaltender in if he's successful or not successful in his goalie career. Yeah, you know, I, I was listening to your interview on the uh, the Goalie Hacks podcast, and you, you said something similar there, and it got me thinking, you know, just in my own journey along the way, and when I had those opportunities to step in, you know, what was that mindset? And my mindset was always, yeah, there, there's a little bit of uh, scariness there because it's um, something new. It, it, it's a step up, but it, it was also the uh, fake it till you make it. Act like you belong there. And mm-hmm. doing mm-hmm. so, just 
making yourself mentally believe you belong there goes yeah. a long way. Whether you do or you don't, it, it goes a long way. I, I think to, sorry, I've shared a couple of times on the podcast of the summer to my junior and senior year of college, I was uh, skating at Johnny's Ice House in Chicago. And uh, I was skating with some NHL and AHL guys. I wasn't to their skill level, but I told myself I belonged out there with them. And therefore yeah, I had a good it. summer. I put, you know, did I stop everything? No, no, no goalie is going to stop everything all summer, but I felt good. I felt like I belonged out there enough so that I may have trash talked a few of them in the locker room every now and then, <laughs> but <laughs> yeah, um, it, it was just one of those where, yeah, you, you have to make yourself believe that, that you belong there, even, even if you don't. Yep. Yep. hundred percent, hundred percent. So key, so key as a goaltender. So you, you make this journey through hockey in your identifying some of these defining moments and kind of where your mind was at that point in time. When did you really start to think about the mental side of the game to the point that now this is what you do? Um, you know, where was it along the way that you were like, huh, there, there's something here with the way I'm thinking versus the way I'm playing. Great, great, great question. Uh, unfortunately, I never thought about it when I was playing like, and, and, and they would bring in the odd sports psychologist to talk to us, talk to our team, but I'd be like, I'd be falling asleep. Mm -hmm. And I don't know why, if it's just because <laughs> they would, it was like, they were reading out of a textbook and giving us these strategies and stuff, but they just lost me. And I noticed they lost a lot of players on the team as well too. Right. And, and it's not as if they don't have good information to use, but that information is only good enough as it can be communicated to the person. Well, and it, to me, it's always felt like a lot of those guys talk to the athlete in clinical terms. Yeah. In terms that we can relate to. Exactly. That's what would happen. And I, and, and they would, they would just totally lose me mm -hmm. like, when, when I probably needed what they had more than almost anyone there. Yeah. Isn't that crazy? And I was just like, Nope, don't need this what's the point but uh I, I wish they had said i wish they had said you know if you apply this here are the results that you can get or this is the difference it can make and here's why or here's the mm -hmm. studies whatever that is now uh, i i i could probably ask me probably say yeah he, he did help me a little bit my coach my freshman sophomore year of high school he was going to school to get his doctorate in psychology and okay. um he lived right down the, you know, two, three blocks away from us. So back then you could do this where he would pick me up for practice most days. So <laughs> me and the coach had, you know, nice conversations to and from practice a lot of times to the point where he joked that he almost wrote his thesis on me uh, being a goalie. But, you know, I, I think back to some of those conversations we had and it was, you know, after a tough game of just trying to get me to understand that, Hey, you let in six goals, but you saw 65 shots, you know, you know, he would point out some of those things of, you know, don't feel bad about the way you put, you played well, he, you know, you're looking at it the wrong way. And even all these years later, sometimes I, I, I think those conversations, whether I think about them or not, help me in my outlook in the beer leagues, a perfect example, this past fall, I was playing on a different team than I normally do. Thank God they scored a lot of goals because I just, I had, <laughs> I was not playing well. And, you know, to the point where like my teammates could see it in me that they're like, you're stopping enough pucks. We're still winning. It's fine. It's like, yeah, but I should be stopping some of these. And finally, one of the guys looked at me, he goes, you're thinking about it too much. He's like, just, just go out there. Stop thinking about it. And it's like, that's exactly what's happened is I had, you know, one or two bad games and it just got my mind too wrapped around it. It was like the old um, Yogi Berra quote. What was it? Uh, the game's 90% mental. The other half is reaction. <laughs> is in your head or something like that? Or yeah. 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 Something like that. I love that quote. Yeah. Yeah. Well, and, and that's what happens. In fact, who is it? I think the guy that worked with Michael Phelps, uh, this, the psychologist, he said something like, you know, when athletes are in a slump, they're just as focused 
as when they're on the top of their game. Mm -hmm. But the challenge is they're focused on the wrong things. So, so and that, that's probably exactly what happened to you there. Yeah. Is you were just as focused, but instead of being a focus on the puck and the play, you're focused on yourself, right? So I mm -hmm. like to use this analogy, you know, where, where you, you just, you, you keep, let's say you have a magnifying glass and where do you want that magnifying glass, right? You want it on the puck and the play, right? So, so I, I actually tell goalies now, this would be interesting to hear your, your perspective on this is I'm like, you're not allowed to look at the clock during a game. And they're like, what? <laughs> because like, I remember when I played, I'd be looking at the clock every 30 seconds. When's this freaking period going to end, right? <laughs> That's what I would be doing. But what happens every time you look at the clock, it, it's like this. So if, if you're in Minnesota in the summer, it's got to be in the summer. It's not going to work in the winter. But if you're there in the summer, you know, a very nice summer, yep. and you got a magnifying glass, and there's sunlight going through it, and it's on some dry brush, and you keep it totally still, you're going to start a fire. Yep. Right? So that's got to be your mind on the puck and the play right mm -hmm. on the puck and then the awareness of the play as soon as you look at that clock it shakes it's like shaking the magnifying glass there will be no fire and then when you come back to the puck there's still those images of the time and then the mind goes what does that time mean there's five minutes left what does that mean we're up by one can we come back can we not come back so all of a sudden the magnifying glass the focus or the flashlight whatever you want to call it is now on all the wrong things, so to speak. Yeah, you know, it's interesting you say that because one of the things I started doing that I didn't do much before is looking at the clock and breaking the game into two minute games. And so I was looking at going, okay, I wanna win the next two minutes. So I, so won, the, I won those two minutes and I was like, okay, let's win the next two to eventually, okay, we've won the period. And, and I, I looked at it as the two minute increments and having that uh, mind of a goldfish, Ted Lasso. And now yeah. uh, once those last two minutes were behind me, I was just focused on winning the next two yeah. minutes. And, and that is one of the things that helped me. And quite honestly, the other is uh, having a beer before the game just chilled me out some. <laughs> <laughs> That's so funny. That's so funny. It takes away all the anxieties. So, so what, what, what I would say I would say forget about the clock, okay? Mm -hmm. And just hear me out here. Hear me out yeah. here. So forget about the clock. Um, because when you're looking at the time, it takes longer. Because you you want to be in the moment. It's just yeah. now, if you look, if you, if you think of your job as a goalie, is your job any different if it's two minutes into the game, two minutes left? Even if your team's down by one and they're going to pull you, well, they're, they're going to tell you to come to the bench. Yeah. Right? You don't need to know. Like, And, and I look back to... I love it when it was Tuka Rask a year or two ago, I think I made this post on it, that he goes to the bench and what had happened there? He went to the bench, but his, his, his team was tied. Yeah. And he goes to the bench for the extra attacker. They're like, get back, get back, get back. I thought that was great because he didn't know what the score was. Mm -hmm. right? Who cares about the score? Like, like you perform best when you're just in the moment for getting about anything else. I would recommend don't go to the bench unless you're called there <laughs> just in case, just in case. So, so here's how I, you, you may want to try this to break it down and let, and let me know if it works for you. I call it the three mental zones. Mm -hmm. So this would be your replacement for time when you're out there. So, so basically the first mental zone is when the whistle goes. So you think of that when the whistle goes to stop the play, almost every goalie, their focus goes to something different. Mm -hmm. So it'll go to that freaking referee is terrible, right? <laughs> or, or it'll go to, oh, uh, uh, I can't believe Bob's coming on defense again, right? Bob, Bob gives the puck away every time, whatever that is, right? But it goes yeah. to all those different things. But really, the only focus when the whistle goes should be rest, relax, revitalize. It's my spa time. It's my time to conserve my concentration calories. Mm -hmm. And that, that breaks it up for you. And then... Before the puck's dropped, what you do is that's when I have my goalies do a pre-face-off routine. And I, I, I can't, I could get into that a little bit today, but they do a pre-face-off routine. So it brings them to their ultimate height, like their excitement level, their 10 out of 10 in confidence. And then they dial it in on just the puck and the play. So now they're maximizing their concentration calories and they keep it that way 
until the next whistle, which could be a long time. So, so then there's mental zone three, which is when your team has full control from the far blue line out, mm -hmm. then you go into mental zone three, which is basically 80% relaxed, 20% aware what's happening. And when your team gives the puck up, now you're right back into mental. So you're going back and forth between mental zone three and mental zone two. Your team gives a puck up. You're back to mental zone two. You're totally dialed in. They get the puck back. They're on the far blue line. Now you're 80, 20. Yeah. Comes out of the blue line. Now you're fully dialed in again. And, and that allows you to, to, to concentrate during the right times of the game. And if you forget about the time, it's amazing. Like I, I got this text from uh, Dylan Ferguson. He's playing for, for Henderson, the silver Knights, the American hockey league after a game, he's like, Pete, I didn't look at the clock once not once the whole game he gets a shutout to nothing and it's like the game seemed like it took five minutes that was it yeah i i wish that were the case in some of my beer league games <laughs> like, gee, have they started it's running time but have they started this clock <laughs> um I'll, I'll have to try that the next game it's gonna have to be a game where the clock is behind me because it's a little bit easier yeah i know what you mean it's harder when you can see it yeah um which I, I've always been the guy that likes to see the clock. So I'm, I'm going to have to try that one and uh, see how it goes. Um, but it, it makes sense, you know, and some of it, you know, I've probably been subconsciously doing for quite a while because when I was coming up, you know, our, my goalie coach taught me at a young age, if, you know, kind of, as you said, between whistles, you, you have a little bit of that relaxation, but you get yourself into position, you know, more so when the yeah. pucks, you know, when the face-offs and your end, you, you hit that mark, you get in position, but even when the face-off is in the far zone, you know, I'm not just standing there with my arms on the crossbar. I might between plays, but once I get ready to drop the puck, I've always a long, long time ago, I adopted, uh, uh, I don't remember if you remember Tommy Salo, he was playing yeah. for Philadelphia and he had that crazy Jofa helmet but he had this thing where he would retreat into the net and they were saying on the broadcast, he likes, so he can feel that center post on his back. Hey, okay. So that yep. when he comes out to make his angle, he knows he's perfectly, you know, in the middle of the net. Yep. Ever since that one broadcast was on ESPN, um, I've done the same thing. So when the puck is in the other zone, when I get ready, I retreat into that net and I'm ready to go. I kind of have that Hashik uh, relaxation look with the hands on the knees yep. crouched over. But as soon as they cross that far blue line, I'm coming out, I'm getting ready. Um, yeah. So there, it's kind, kind of what you're talking about. I, I, I think you could say I'm in that mental mode. It's just physically coming out at the same time. Got it. Love it. Yeah, I that, love it. That makes sense to me. Yeah. Um, now, when you were on the Goalie Hacks podcast, you know, you had mentioned of turning off video games on game days and just kind of clearing, you know, the mental capacity. Because I, I believe you shared uh, Patrick Laine and his Fortnite addiction. <laughs> and the more he played, <laughs> yeah. the, the more yeah. he played, the worse, uh, more he played Fortnite, the worse he performed on the ice. But with cell phones and all of this other stuff, especially distance learning for kids and everything else, it's become harder and harder to log off. You know, I, I notice it with myself, you know, if a commercial comes on, I instinctively pick up the phone to see what's going on. How, how do you encourage goalies to kind of have that, not necessarily the digital detox, get rid of all of it, but to be like, you know what? put that phone down, you know, yeah, yeah, go 15 yeah. minutes without looking at it. You know, it's going to be okay. How do you, and there go the dogs. <laughs> Love it. What um, kind of dogs do you have? Uh, we have a petite golden doodle. Um, okay. And then we have a wiener dog. So oh, nice. Yeah. And, well, something's excited them. Yeah. It, it's funny that wiener dog, she, she's got a Napoleon complex, like none other. <laughs> That's great. Um, but how, okay. how do you, suggest goalies you know put that phone down and kind of step away and kind of deal with that anxiety of oh my god what's going on on my phone <laughs> yeah 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 no totally uh I, I would actually start with uh with sleep with with uh, bedtime 
mm -hmm. and, and and sleep because like I had a client who's uh, playing in the, the North American Hockey League uh, this week. We had to go through a resetting of his sleep patterns. And he, he's good. He's one of the top goalies in the league. He's playing in the showcase and all that good stuff there. But he was getting some nights, he was getting three, four hours sleep a night, which is which is unacceptable. Yeah. It's just, you, how do you perform? Well, you, you know, you know how you feel if you get three hours yeah. sleep. And, I remember yeah. those days when my kids were little and it wasn't fun. <laughs> it's not right. I know those, those, those yeah, exactly, exactly. And, and studies have shown, studies have, have shown like scientific studies have shown uh, with, I think it's tennis players or, or basketball players, their, their accuracy, their shots improved nine, nine percent more if they got 10 hours of sleep a night mm -hmm. more. So a lot of guys, like a lot of, a lot of goalies I talk to, like these are pros, these are juniors. I'm like, you need 10 hours. And they're like, are you, they think I'm nuts sometimes. <laughs> I'm like, you need that, that, that 10 out, like you, you need, a lot of guys are getting six, seven, eight, and they don't understand that they're working so hard in practice and all that stuff. But sometimes to be very successful, it's not about working harder, right? It, mm -hmm. Sometimes it, it's about, if you get that sleep, all of a sudden your, your focus, your cognitive skills are that much higher, that much better. Because with, without that, nothing matters. So, so anyways, going back to your question about the phone. So I have a pre-sleep checklist for their bedroom where the phone cannot come in the bedroom when they sleep. It's got to stay up because if, and you know, if, if you wake up, let's say something wakes you up at 2.30 in the morning, for some reason you hear it, your dog barks, mm -hmm. right? So, so, so you wake up and as soon as you look at your phone, there's chemicals released in your brain. And some of them are saying, grab me, grab me, go on Instagram or something like that. Or maybe someone emailed me. I don't know. Right. And all of a sudden you're on your phone, but even if you don't pick it up, those chemicals are already released. Mm -hmm. and, and so part of it is keeping the phone out. If you can do that, stay away from the phone for see the, at least 11 hours and 10 hours to sleep. But an hour before you go to sleep, that phone is out of the room. Right. And then by doing that, that, that is a, that's a good chunk that you're getting started from. And then, then the, the rest is just, you know, only going on it for a purpose. A lot of people go on it all the time for entertainment. Mm -hmm. And if, if they can only go on it for a purpose at set times during the days, now uh, that's not going to happen with everyone. That's not going to happen with everyone, but it, it is, it is a, uh, a great way to lower that screen time. Cause that, that affects everything. Yeah. It's funny, uh, my brother-in-law was over before Christmas and we were picking on him for how much time he spends on TikTok, you know, when he's at home, just watching TV, he finds himself on TikTok. And so then we were all kind of shaming ourselves at uh, our screen time uh, reports. And so yeah. then it was kind of a, uh, a challenge to see who by Christmas could have the lowest screen time. Lowest screen time. And we didn't actually... Um, check on each other but I noticed you know yeah I, I kind of felt good or bad shamed into lowering that screen time for a while and uh it, it's hard sometimes at work because I was like well I use my phone sometimes for work so when you're on the phone it counts it I said and then I listen to if I'm not on my phone for work I have podcasts going and it's like it's counting that as screen time even though all I'm doing is listening so then, then we yeah changed it to look at the uh, individual apps that you are using. And, it, but it was like, yeah, we, we do spend way too much time on our phones. And I, I don't think we realize what that does to the rest of our thinking of our day-to-day -day lives, especially yeah. goaltenders, you know, um, for whatever reason though, when I get to the rink, that's when I'm less inclined to look at my phone. It's almost like that's the rink is where I go and it's just, no, you know, I might look at the time as I'm waiting to see, you know, do I need to check and see if the Zamboni's getting on the ice or, yet? But th that's one of the few places where I do put the phone away and it's just like, nope, <laughs> we're good to go. And, and there, there isn't that anxiety either of yeah. what am I missing? Um, even yeah. when I, you know, I know some guys, they get off the ice and the 
first thing they do is they look at their phone in part because we play on Sunday nights. So they wanted to see how their fantasy football team was doing. Uh, but um, th- that's the first thing they do when they get to the locker room is they look at that phone and it's like, no, I, I don't need to do that. Um, Cause in part I've gotten a Apple watch. So if some, somebody texts me saying, you know, stop on your way home, I'm going to get it there too. I'm going to know your watch. Yep. Yeah. For, for whatever reason, the family always starts a group text when I'm playing hockey. So my glove hand wrist is just vibrating the whole game. I'm like, oh, you got the Apple watch on when you're playing. Yeah. I'm like, come Love on, it. guys. It, I, I want to see what my heart rate is, you know, throughout games. Yeah. Because uh, I, I I always thought that my heart rate would I'd be able to watch and see the peaks and valleys of my heart rate based on game situations. But I've noticed that. uh I don't, I don't, not a doctor, but this is probably a good thing. My heart rate stays pretty steady throughout the game. You know, it doesn't have this giant peak, um, you know, at the, the height of the game or anything. So I think that's a good thing. Uh, but I, I still I like to check it after games to make yeah. sure that things aren't crazy. Um, you, you, you ever listen to music when you play? No. Um, I don't just because I I've got enough going on in my head uh, <laughs> that I think if I, I were listening to music, I would probably get too into the song and not pay attention to the thought. Um, although I do remember when I was in high school, Gary Presley, the Chicago Cubs organist, he would play at our high school games. So I always listened to his organ playing uh, between whistles. And I, I, I was known to dance to the songs every now and then. There you go. <laughs> Uh, I, awesome. I always liked when a goalie made a big save, he would play the all state you're in good hands theme. So yeah. whenever, even today, when I see an all state commercial and they play that uh, theme song, I, I just kind of smile. It's like, yep, I like that one. Um, but no, I've, I've never listened to music. You know, I, I might sing to myself every now and then when the puck's at the other end. Um, okay. uh, another thing I've started to do for focus is counting shots. Not because I'm doing the math in my head to see what my goal is against for, or the uh, save percentage for the game, but it's just counting shots to see, stay focused. Um, and then there's the games where I get so many where I just say, ah, enough is that. So let's just stop the next one. <laughs> <laughs> there you go. Um, so one, one of the things you've mentioned on a different podcast on Ingle, the, the goalie hacks one that uh, I had mentioned earlier is visualization. Uh, yep. and I think a lot of athletes have been doing this for a while. Um, you know, you brought up on the, the one podcast, the, uh, I think it was the Chicago state, um, study where the basketball players that didn't even touch a basketball just, Chicago. Yeah. Yeah. And so I, I always focus on vis- visualization before games. My teammates used to pick on me in college cause we'd be on the bus and I'm sitting there with my eyes closed, my headphones, you know, going through um, to this day in the locker room, you know, I, I get down into the butterfly and I follow the puck into the glove a couple of times, follow it into the blocker. Um, but at what point does all of this vis- visualization, um, you know, some of these different drills, when does too much become too much? When, when do we get, at what point do we get into our own heads and it's like, nope, We just need to open our eyes and be in the moment. Well, I think you have to have uh, as a goal, especially for, well, for any goaltender, right? Pro or or men's league, uh, minor hockey, you got to have times where you're totally away from the game. Mm -hmm. Like, like, like for example, I've just talked to one of my clients in, in Europe. He plays in the same league that Tim Thomas played in before he came back and played for the, the, the Boston Bruins there. And um, one of the things we talked about was when he's away from the game is that he's away from the game, mm-hmm. not thinking about it at all. Right. We got, we got the routines. Uh, you got the, the, so, so here's, here's what, here's what I recommend they do as far. So, so number one, you got to have that time away from the game. Like you're not thinking about it. You're doing other stuff. You're reading whatever, right. Because or else you will, burn yourself out if that's all that's going through your head right and then then i recommend 
for practices. So if you have a practice tomorrow, we got, I got this system on, I got the, what's called the Goalie Mindset Academy has all the journals and prep routines mm -hmm. on it for guys to do. And so the night before practice, I recommend you go on, you do your practice prep. You come up with one to three skills you want to get better at, run the movie for three minutes of getting better at that skill. Then you, you forget about it. You don't think about it. It's already in the subconscious mind. When you go to sleep, it'll be doing its stuff. It'll be working. Then you go practice. And after practice, the first thing you do is you do your journal after you go through your successes. And, and once again, this is all the 20, the 23% rule, right? Almost every goalie goes through the things they didn't do well. You, you may go through that sometimes after you perform, right? <laughs> the mind goes to that. It's so easy. You made 40 saves and you're, and you're talking about the two or three that you didn't make. Yeah, I, you were talk, You were telling the story on that other podcast I mentioned of Carey Price in, in his yes. answer of, I didn't, it wasn't that, you know, he did something wrong. It was, I didn't make the save. He, he looked at it as in terms of a save, even though he didn't make it. A couple powerful things with, a couple powerful things with Carey Price. Number one is, I think I think I mentioned that podcast that I was speaking to a group of goaltenders and coaches in Vancouver, and one of the goalie coaches came up to me after, and I was talking about the basketball study, the 23% rule, how just through visualizing the basketball players were able to improve their basketball free throw percentage by 23%. And so I said, you know, you, you, you do it before you go on the ice, you do it after a game, you focus on what you did well, most goalies focus on what they don't do well. So after he comes up to me, he goes, it's amazing. Goes, he said, well, when I coached Kerry Price when he was playing in Tri-Cities in the American Hockey League, after games, I always ask goalies, how did you do? How do you think you did? And they always go to the saves they didn't make right away. Like th they'll stop 40 or 41. They'll talk about the one they didn't save. Kerry Price was the opposite. He said, we would lose 7-2. I think he played terrible. And I'd say, how'd you do? And he'd go, well, you know, I made this nice glove save. I made this breakaway <laughs> save. And so... So he said, so after every game, Carey Price was getting 23% better, where all the other goalies in the league were getting 23% worse, just by what was going through their, their, going through their, their head. Now, I think that's a lot more de-stressing than if you are going over all the things you didn't do well, because I think you could really burn out when you do that. Yeah, right? absolutely. You know, because that's what I was thinking about uh, before we started talking is, if, if we're constantly thinking about, I need to do this, I need to do that. And then for whatever reason, it doesn't happen the game, you know, yeah. that then that snowball that I was in this fall of I'm in my own head, I'm overthinking the game. Yeah. Uh, yeah. You know, and now, I mean, we have great tools now like sense arena where, you know, some of the vis visualization we've talked about doing in the past, we don't have to close our eyes to do it. We just have to put the Oculus on. Um, yeah it's it's pretty awesome in fact i i don't have a sense arena uh subscription but there is a i i call it the the beer league budget sense arena there's a goalie there's a goalie game on the oculus nowhere near what sense arena is but one of the games on there is just three guys at the blue line taking shots well as a beer league goalie to get that as warm-ups would be amazing so I throw that on before I head to the rink and it's funny on how much better I play in the games when I do that before I leave for the rink versus the ones I don't. Love um, it. Yeah. Uh, in fact, when I had Brian DeCord on, I was telling him about it and saying, you know, have you guys thought about kind of like a beer league version where it's just a warm up, you know, a little bit cheaper than, than the current subscription, but just kind of give us that warm up before we leave the rink and he goes well we do have a meeting tomorrow morning at 5 a.m uh, he's like i'll bring it up uh so who knows there, there might be something in the works uh um, oh, that's great so i want to be uh cognizant of time i like to end every episode with a series of 10 rapid fire questions i've asked every hey, guest let's do it I've asked, i love it well and the, the fun thing is i i've asked every guest the same questions uh so that that i think is the fun part for listeners and just before Christmas, I started going back and writing down uh, some of the answers to them so that I can get a breakdown because I think it's going to be interesting when I'm all done. Uh, the first one is, what's the craziest coaching moment from your playing days? Oh, my, 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 okay, I'll be really quick. 
my first game when I got brought up at the end of that game, at the end of the game, the coach went around and he went to Jimmy Playfair. He went to Jimmy Playfair, who was like six three, six four, and he's like, "You haven't, you weren't working hard enough." Blah 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 blah. He takes basically his uh, jersey and he starts beating him with it like a dog. <laughs> that was <laughs> that was like one. Of, that's the first thing that came to mind. That was one of them. I don't think he would do that now. A lot of coaches learn as as they go and stuff like that. But that was super. I was like, "Whoa." what am I in for here? Um, that, that, yeah, that, that would have been one of them. Okay, go ahead. Uh, so what's your favorite all-time goalie mask? Ken Dryden comes to mind. The one where, not, not the painted one, but the other one. The pretzel one? Yeah, yeah, I love that. I love that. In fact, I, I didn't like him as much when he came back with the other one. Yeah, I, I, uh, I've gone back to, I discovered that his book is on audiobook now. And I, I read his book many years ago, but it was like, it's on audiobook now. So that's what I listened to on my way home from beer league the, games. The, are you talking the game, the game? Yeah. Yeah. And he's, oh, is the, it on audible? Is it he, on audible? It's on audible and he is the uh, narrator. So narrator. I, I, oh, I've been listening to, to that on my uh, drive home from games now, just as a nice little decompression. Uh, Thank you. One, one of the greatest books ever written in my opinion is yeah, so good. Yeah, I made yeah. my dad read it uh, and he wasn't into, you know, sports books or anything but he's like yeah this yeah. is pretty good um speaking of books that you'd probably enjoy and probably have already read uh, sacred hoops by phil jackson that's a great oh, one i have it i bet that's on audible yeah that that's a great book you know just talking about the mindset of the athlete and how he used zen buddhism to get those 90s bulls teams yeah. to come together for the greater good and the only reason I read that book is I went to an all boys Catholic high school in Chicago, and this was during the Jordan era. And rather than give us summer reading of the classics that they knew we wouldn't read, and we would go by the cliff notes at B. Dalton bookstore right before school started, they wanted a book that didn't have cliff notes. And so they found right. something they thought we would be interested in and actually read. So they chose Sacred Hoops. And you know what? A lot more of us actually read that book. And it, that was another one. It was so good. It's like, dad, you need to read this book. Uh, cool. And uh, so, so he did. And I, I've read that one actually twice. But it, again, th the reason they had us read it was the idea of uh, his spirituality impacting, you know, his day to day activities as a basketball coach. But I liked it from the coaching standpoint of how do I get a guy like Michael Jordan who can go out and win games on his own? to be a team player, something that, you know, the previous coach wasn't able to do. And how do I get him? And, you know, especially now you, you go back and you watch that last dance documentary and you see how different mm. these guys were and personalities. They didn't necessarily get as long, get along as we may have been oh. led to believe. Dennis Rodman, Dennis Rodman. Yeah. Yeah. And that, that piece of Phil Jackson, I, I thought they could have played up more and how he, brought them all together and he, he was even the one he's like hey if Dennis needs time needs his time he needs his time and then he goes off and disappears for three days um, you know what other coach is gonna do that um, I know I know I love it but yeah it was just he, he knew what they needed and he, he was able to work it but great great book I, I loved it um so next question what is your favorite rink that you've played at favorite rink that I played at there's so many that come to mind. <laughs> so many that come to mind. My favorite one. You know what? I'm going to say in uh, the Coliseum in Portland. Okay. Cool. Uh, that, that was, I just felt great. Whether I was, when I played for Portland or when I played against them, I just loved, I don't know why there was something about it, but actually, you know what? No, that wasn't the, it, it's not there anymore. The Memorial arena in Victoria. Oh, cool. That was, that was, I loved the ice there. It was always really, I knew one of the ice makers, um, Rob Kelbo, he was fantastic. And yeah, it was, it was very good. It's not there. It's called the Save on Food Center. It's a different, different setup and stuff like that. But yeah, that was my, Grant Fear would have played in the Memorial Arena in Victoria. Very cool. I'll have to look that one up. Uh, so what's your favorite stick that you ever used? Favorite stick was a Louisville. In fact, I remember when I was playing in Sweden, I think it would be one of the ones, it was a Kirk McLean. 
I think, was it a Kurt McLean? Yeah, it was. It was a Kurt McLean Louisville stick. So I didn't have my own pattern, but so I, I, I like Kurt McLean so much and the curve on it that, that I used that one. Awesome. Yeah, th those Louisville st sticks, I mean, <laughs> they, they were the Louisville Slugger, you know, brand and they, they, they lived up to it. They, they were beast. Um, yes. yes. So yes. the next one is what's your favorite youth hockey memory? I think it would be Pee Wee when I was playing. Pee There's a lot of good memories from Pee Wee for, for some reason, uh, <laughs> you know, just, uh, yeah, I, I, I think one of my favorites is I was at a, a teammate's house and, um, you know, you had the sleepovers back then and we got up in the morning and, and he, he said, he introduced me to, to crepes with chocolate chips and icing sugar. That's that, 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 that stands out. <laughs> that is awesome. Growing up in a good Catholic family, you know, during Lent on Fridays, we wouldn't eat meat and my mom didn't like fish. So it was usually crepes for dinner and uh, chocolate chips and, you know, some whipped cream sometimes on those crepes. Yeah, th those were good oh. lentil Friday meals for us. Loved it. <laughs> Um, what's the best chirp you've heard on the ice, off the ice, in the locker room? Best chirp I've heard. Oh, oh this is a, this is actually, I thought this was really good. Um, this was when I, I went to camp in New Jersey and they sent me to Utica in the American Hockey League. Mm -hmm. And I, I, everything I did was wrong in that training camp. I, I was terrible in the fitness testing. I never saw him. I didn't have a clear picture of playing there. And the only game I played well was, was uh, the, our first exhibition game in Utica. I was supposed to play for Utica. I broke my skates in morning skate. Uh, they got me new ones, but I was all about excuses. Well, I can't play with new skates. So that, that day, they, uh, the Rochester, because it was in Utica, Rochester's trainers forgot their goalie's equipment. Dar Darcy Walklock and someone else forgot their goalie's equipment. So they said, well, you're going to play for Rochester tonight. I'm like, what? They're like, yeah, yeah. <laughs> so I, 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 that was the only game I played well. We won two, one, I stood on my head and I remember Keith Gretzky was on the team. Uh, it was, it was, yeah, it was really cool. So then the next game I'm starting the next night where I'm starting the next night for Utica in Rochester and not doing so well. Paul Stewart was the referee. You ever, you ever heard of Paul yep. Stewart, ex hockey player, tough yep. guy. And I, I was known for, I, I, I wouldn't abuse the refs, but I would like, I would take, I think, I would think that I had control over them. Right. Mm -hmm. Like, for example, if they weren't calling stuff, I'm like, you better call the next one or I'm going to take this guy's head off. And I would say stuff like that. Right. To try to. And, and so I, I, I said something to Paul Stewart and he looks at me and he's just like, nice goals against average. Like, that's all he said. <laughs> <laughs> and, and, and I was speechless. I was speechless. I didn't know what to say. Uh, referees had never talked to me like that before. So, so, so you that never, was the best term. You never had a goalie coach that taught you that you're supposed to be nice to the refs and, you know, butter them up so that you get the quick whistles? I know. It, it was different times sometimes back then, right? It was, you know, because guys are running goalies, yeah. and stuff like that. It, Ron Hextall area, era, era, right? Yeah, Hexall and Billy Smith. I mean, oh. <laughs> those were two beasts in their own right. Uh, so what's the worst post-game beer you've had? Worst what? Post-game beer. Post-game beer. Oh, man. Got to go back in the days. Um, I think it was play when I was playing on the coast in Knoxville. Um, yeah, it would have been there. Because I'm, I'm Canadian, right? So the American beer is really weak. So I'll, I'll yeah. say that. <laughs> I'm just joking. I really don't remember. I don't. It, it's funny you say that because I, I'm a home brewer and I, I was reading about, you know, the difference between Guinness in America and Guinness in Ireland and how uh, most people really like Guinness in Ireland. And they say it's probably psychological because it's where it's from, but they said it really comes down to the water. But the Irish really like American Guinness because it's got a higher ABV because of the difference in laws so they, they okay. like the american guinness because they can get drunk quicker <laughs> oh there you go that's funny that's the crazy 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 rules here a quick little trivia when guinness uh the person who started guinness he was such a visionary such a visionary 
the lease for the brewery, do you know how long a lease he signed? I, I forget. It was like two or 300 years, wasn't it? Yeah, 40, I think I, today, I, I'm sure they said 40,000 years. I'm like, what? 40, that's quite a long lease. Yeah. <laughs> Things don't go right anyways. It was, it was, it was quite a long time. Yeah, I, I'm somewhat excited. They've decided to build their next American brewery in Chicago. So, uh, so hopefully, oh, there you go. Hopefully, the next time I go back there, it'll be uh, built and opened, and I can uh, go there and check it out. Uh, I love Chicago. I was there for the NHL draft four years ago, maybe 2017. Yeah. We did it's, the tour, like the whole tour, the mafia tour and stuff. It was great. Yeah, it, it's a great city. Uh, it's having some issues right now, though, but it's it's a great city with unbelievable food. Um, oh yeah. Yeah, and I I, uh, I grew up the son of a fireman, and I used to go to oh, work nice. with my dad as often as I could. So I saw parts of the city uh, I probably shouldn't have at those ages. <laughs> oh, I could imagine. Yeah, but oh, God, was it fun. Never got into too much trouble, though. Uh, <laughs> so when you tape your stick, do you tape it heel to toe or toe to heel? God, I would go, I'd go toe to heel. Okay. Or I would do one around the toe and then would I go heel to toe? I forget, but I do it in a way so that it grips the puck better. I haven't taped it a stick in so long, but I do it in a way so it grips the puck better. Um, back in my back in my playing days in the Western Hockey League, right? Because uh, we played against Brandon and their goaltender was Ron Hextall. Mm -hmm. And the, so he fired the puck, it hits the glass behind our net. <laughs> the next morning, the coach puts myself and our other goalie on the goal line says, fire the puck as high and hard as you can. Well, you know, if you're on the goal line, you're looking up bikes. It's like putting 500 pounds on the barbell and trying to press it. Yeah. And right? so anyways, I, I didn't fare too well there, but I, I, I vowed from that day to work on my shot <clears throat> and it improved. I had really good, but I would curve my stick so much that there's a few saves I didn't make. They'd wrap it around. And if, if I, you know, cause sometimes you would stand up back then, but it hit my stick and it would just like keep going. Cause I'd have the upshoot on it. I, I still cover the posts. Like we were taught in the late eighties, early nineties, you know, be the door. If the pucks on the goal line or below, you know, at your parallel, but as soon as it crosses, you come back out and you know what, nobody's scored, you know, over my shoulder on the post. Uh, <laughs> so it, it's kind of funny when, when I cover the posts that way, the, the comments I get. Um, so the next question, we're almost done here. What's your favorite number to wear and why? Uh, tw 29, Ken Dryden. Good, good number. Good reason. So the, the last question, and, and I think this is probably the most important question I ask everybody. What advice do you have for even goaltenders other than to join the goalie mindset? <laughs> <laughs> That's hilarious. Uh, my biggest advice for young goaltenders is to build your love for the game. Like just build your love for the game because everything will follow that. A lot of times I think goalies and, and even players can get too caught up in a lot of other stuff. Whereas, you know, I, I played goal when I was younger cause I loved it. Cause I mm -hmm. loved it. And uh, you know, sometimes when I was playing uh, in junior or pro there were times when I, when I, when I didn't like it and it's because I had forgotten about my love for the game and why I played in the first place. So build, build your love for the game. Yeah. It's interesting you say that. Cause I know a lot of goalies that, um, you know, they, they get done playing competitively and then they walk away from the game for a little while, you know, yeah. whether it be two, three years and you know, they all say, well, they, they had just played enough of it and it got too much, you know, like, a job almost. Yeah. You know? And yeah. then it was that time away. And there, there was always something, you know, one of the goalies I talked to, you know, uh, a stadium series game was in his city. So he got to go skate on that ice and he's like, why, why did I stop? Uh, you know, for me, I, I only stepped away because we had kids and it was like, I can't be going and playing uh, when we get trying to get kids to bed, but it made me appreciate the position again. When, when I was able to come back and so, sometimes that's what happens is you, you forget why you love it. And once you rediscover it, it's like, Oh my God, I'm never letting it go. 100%. Yeah. 100%. Yep. So love where, it. 
where can folks follow you online so that uh, they can, you know, continue to get some great insights on how to uh, just stay focused and be the best goalie they can be? Well, the, they can follow me on Insta. I think it's uh, goalie underscore mindset, I believe. Goalie underscore mindset on Instagram. They can just go, they can go to petefry.net and everything's on there. Just petefry.net. So P E T E F R Y dot N E T. And a lot, a lot of the information is, uh, is on there. Yeah. And I'll be sure to get that in the show notes so that uh, people don't have to look too far. Um, so, Pete, thanks for joining me. Sounds tonight. great. It's Sounds been a, great. It's been a great conversation. If uh, your travels bring you through the Twin Cities and uh, White Bear Lake again, uh, we'll have to go to the 617 yeah. and grab a drink together. Let's do it. I'd li- yeah, do it. And by the way, if you want to give away, um, yeah. what, what, what I was saying, Joe, if you want, I, I don't mind giving away a couple copies of my book as well, too. Um, if you ever need that, or you want something, let me know, or I could send directly to the people or send them to you or whatever, whatever works. Yeah, I'll, uh, I'll think of something we'll coordinate. And, uh, cause the, this episode will, will launch, um, on Tuesday. Um, okay. and, uh, I'll, I'll think of something and we'll maybe perfect somebody a book. Yeah. And like you said, if you're back in white okay, bear, my like friend, six seventeen is the the old little joint in downtown White Bear we like to go to. So let's do it. The, the last time I was there in White Bear Lake, and I don't know if it was the last time, but uh, the old business that I had, we actually trained Will Ferrell to to teach him how to skate for the movie Elf. Right. Oh, cool. And so he was coming into my my location in Vancouver, and I, I remember I would I I had to be in Minnesota, so I was in White Bear Lake at the time, so I missed meeting him uh live uh for that but it, it's Where, become quite a nostalgic movie there elf yeah it's so so unfortunate that they cut that scene out of the movie too oh the the skating scene yeah yeah, yeah they the, did didn't they yeah but it, it it still found its way into you know the internet and it's such okay. a great scene yeah um love it yeah in fact we had a backyard ice rink last year and i have an elf costume so there's oh, a video perfect. on my Instagram of my son skating around and I just check him right into the snowbank. <laughs> That's the best. Yeah. I love it. Love so it. when you were in White Bear, uh, who was it with? There, 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 there was a, a training center there. It was called Puck Masters. Oh, yeah. Do you, I don't know if you remember that. It was, uh, it was there for two years, three years, I think, or something like that. It was like a chain of training centers, but it was a tough business, right? Yeah. Like, the whole hot training type, you know, yeah. it's, it's like a baseball, uh, you know, like a pitching cage and stuff yeah, like that, I'm right? Yeah, trying, trying to remember where that was in White Bear, but I do remember them being around. It would have been like 2006 or something like that, I think, or yeah, man, like a long time ago. Yeah, I, I was actually coaching up in Forest Lake at the time, so I remember, okay. um, I remember it being around i just can't remember yeah. exactly where Got it was it. in town but uh, awesome it was well, cool it was a great location i had the owner of the minnesota wild come down uh at the time and stuff and a couple of players and stuff it was pretty cool but anyways it's all yeah. good well i'm gonna go get uh some dinner going for the family uh okay thanks again do it, Joe. it's been okay, a buddy. treat talking to you all right great chatting talk real soon bye Thank now you. bye bye What an awesome conversation with Pete. Well, this is the first time we've ever talked. It felt like Pete had been coaching me for years. He's challenged me to not look at the clock in my next beer league game. That's not going to be easy for me. I'm not going to lie, but I'm going to try my best. Be sure to follow Pete on social media. He can be found on Instagram at goalie underscore mindset, on Twitter at Pete Fry underscore mindset, and search for him on Facebook and YouTube. You can find me on Instagram, Twitter, Facebook, and YouTube simply by searching for Washed Up Goalie. Visit washupgoalie.com for some great hockey-related content, my beer league hockey video highlights, and of course, all podcast episodes. If you want some Washed Up Goalie or Tendy Talk apparel, be sure to visit my Threadless shop by clicking the merchandise link on my website. If you like this podcast, go listen to the BLPA Big Show. It's the OG BLPA Podcast Network show where a couple of beer league players talk beer league hockey, draft experience shenanigans, and exploits from around the game. Be sure to check out the full lineup of hockey-related podcasts on the Hockey Podcast Network as well. 
There are too many lists here, but shows like Tales with TR Podcasts, The Quack Report Podcast, and The Sporty Podcast can all be found. I need to thank the Ben Zambonis for allowing me to use their music on my podcast. You can download their music on iTunes or listen wherever you stream music from. I'm always working on lining up other goalies to talk to. If you are a goalie or have connections to a goalie who I should talk to, shoot me an email at washupgoalie39 at gmail.com or send me a DM on social media. Let's not forget, if you are a brand who wants to sponsor the show, be sure to reach out out to me. I'd be happy to talk. And finally, if you like what you hear, be sure to subscribe, rate, and comment on the podcast platform you're listening on. It's a quick action on your part that helps others find Tendy Talk. So, until next time, keep your stick on the ice and your body square to the pocket.